Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, let me start by thanking Robert and all the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to this very exciting meeting. Uh, I'll be talking about cell-safe variability and its implications in confluent epithelial monolayer. This, uh, in this direction, we are interested uh, from the perspective of two long-term goals in our group. Uh, the first one is this morphogenesis or pattern formation. And in this uh, problem, we are interested into the problems, for example, embryogenesis, pattern formation in Drosophila wing disk, or organ formation in general. Uh, for this purpose, we need uh, both the cellular dynamics and functions. Uh, can I? Uh, is this okay if I stand here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, so we need both the cellular dynamics and functions, functions in the form of cell division and apoptosis. Um, for the dynamics, we know that the dynamics in the confluent uh, cellular system is uh, more glass-like, and we are developing simplified analytical theory to describe the dynamics in this system. But uh, today, I'll not be talking about the dynamics. I'll focus on the other aspect, uh, where we are trying to use the cell shape variability and the description of cell shape to develop a analytical uh, sort of description for the cellular function in the form of division and, uh, and uh, apoptosis. The other problem is this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So during this um, transition, the epithelial cells, which have this uh, out-of-plane polarity, it changes its polarity to in-plane polarity, and it develops motility. And uh, so this is uh, relevant for, uh, for example, at the early stage of cancer, where the monolayer changes properties, uh, its dynamics as well as cell shape. And we are trying to develop a physical characterization for the early stage of this cancer infection. Okay, so now cell shape in the last uh, couple of decades or more, many studies have shown that there is a strong correlation between cell shape and uh, various biological functions. Here I have listed some of the papers that have shown this. Uh, the main point is that uh, the cell shape and the various crucial biological functions, they, they, they can be quite strongly correlated. For example, cell division, growth and apoptosis, division plane orientation, differentiation or morphogenesis. And cell shapes are also crucial during uh, both health and disease. In our uh, body itself, there are about 200 different types of uh, cells with varying shapes and size. And here I have shown two snapshots, one from the non-asthmatic and another from asthmatic uh, monolayer. And this is taken from uh, this paper by Max and uh, others from Fedworks group. Uh, so here, as you see that uh, the variability and the cell shape, every cell shape, they both change during non-asthmatic and uh, asthmatic uh, cell monolayer. Cell shape also changes during different biological process, uh, for example, during the development of cancer, asthma, during wound healing or development, it changes quite progressively uh, the, during this process. Furthermore, cells are also the functional units of tissue, and therefore tissue shape must originate at the cell shape. And uh, so it's important to understand quantitatively what is the origin and how, the, how cell shapes behave. And another aspect that we are exploring in this direction is to try and understand if we can describe cellular functions in terms of cell shape. So the, uh, the idea is as follows. Uh, cellular function, they must originate from different biochemical signaling network, and it's very complex to describe by analytics. Uh, so this, but this, um, this uh, shape gene interaction network, this biochemical signaling network, they, they control both the cellular function as well as the cell shape. So the idea is the following, that can we treat this shape gene interaction network and try and develop a statistical mechanics like description of functions in terms of cell shape. So that is the idea in this way. Now this question of shape versus gene, it has, uh, sorry, shape versus uh, function, it has been studied mostly at the single cell level or at the level of averages. For example, in this work uh, that appeared in Cell in 2011, they studied the sea urchin cells on pattern substrate and studied the division plane orientation as a function of cell shape. And in the other two studies that I have shown here, uh, they have studied the similar uh, division plane orientation as a function of average over the entire cell. Uh, but if you see on a, on a, on a snapshot of uh, the cell monolayer, the cell to cell shape varies quite widely. And then the question arises, why should the average be enough, or is it really enough? Uh, is the shape variability too complex to understand, or can we bring in some meaningful insight from that? Or does it have any importance, or cell shape variability is simply biologically unimportant noise? Let me just say, assuming, or if one is making an assumption that an average cell shape is enough, where is it coming into any discussion of biological? So, for example, this one, 
So why, why does one need to think about? Yeah, so the question has been shown that there is a correlation between cell shape, if it's cell shape, and the division, division plane orientation, differentiation, etc. So what we are trying to describe, we want to develop a theory for morphogenesis, for example. Now we need both division, division plane orientation, and apoptosis. And the question that we are exploring, can I use the division uh, cell shape as a proxy for function? So we want to develop an analytical theory in terms of the cell shape. Okay, so in a, uh, in a seminal work in 2018, so Max B, Leo Atia, and from Fedora's group, they have shown a couple of remarkable results for the cell shape variability in this system. The first result they showed that the cell to cell shape variability across diverse epithelial monolayers follows a nearly universal distribution. So they describe the cell shape via aspect ratio. They write down the gyration tensor for each of the cells. Now, this will be a two, two by two tensor. Then they diagonalize it, there will be two eigenvalues. Each of the eigenvalues is proportional to the square of the major and the minor axis of an equivalent ellipse. From there, they take the ratio of the major and the minor axis, and then they define the aspect ratio. When they plot the probability distribution function for defined monolayers, uh, a human bronchial epithelial cell, MGCK, or Drosophila wing disk, as a function of this aspect ratio, they find some distribution for each of these monolayers. But when they plot this particular quantity x, which is the ratio of aspect ratio minus 1 divided by the average aspect ratio minus 1, the PDF of this quantity x seems to show a nearly same distribution. Furthermore, they fit this data with a particular function known as k-gamma function. It has only one parameter, k. And for this diverse epithelial monolayer, they seem to find what is the value of k is around 2.5. So there is some small deviation, I mean, range of k, but it's very close to around 2.5. The second result is the following. When they plot the standard deviation as a function of the average aspect ratio, they see that for all these diverse epithelial monolayer, they seem to follow this same trend. So it seems to follow or fall on this particular line. And it's a universal uh, sort of relation for different monolayer. And in many subsequent studies over the years for both experiments and simulations, they have shown that uh, this applicability of the k gamma function and as well as uh, the k around 2.5. So there are different cancer cell monolayer. There are also various uh, theoretical uh, active and, uh, and non-active uh, systems. And all of them seem to suggest the applicability of the k gamma function for the cell shape variability and the value of k around 2.5. Now, all of these results, they seem to suggest that there should be some basic fundamental reason behind this, uh, this observation. And uh, the questions that we address, what is the origin of this universality? Is there, are there truly uh, universal? What it sets the specific value of 2.5 and why this k-gamma function applies? And is there any consequences of this? And answers to this type of question requires an analytical framework. That is what I'm going to describe in the next few minutes. Okay, so now let's start with a very uh, simple, simplified physical description of cells. For most practical purpose, the mechanical property of a cell is governed by a thin layer of cytoplasm just below the cell membrane. This is known as actomycin cortex. And then cells also interact with each other via different addition molecules like e gadarin and there are also tight junction, desmosome, etc. And cells also interact with the focal, uh, with uh, the substrate via the focal addition. Now, for this conference system, there are uh, two very unique uh, sort of specific properties uh, come from experiments. The first one is that they are confluent. So this is the regime that I'll be focusing. Uh, uh, what it means that the cells entirely cover the whole space, and the, the packing fraction remains unity at all time. The second aspect is the height of the cells remains uh, nearly constant, and this allows a two-dimensional description of the system. So this system, the theoretical development, it basically relies on this particular uh, energy function that has also been flashed earlier. So the first term is the area constant, and the second part is the perimeter constant. The area constant comes from the consideration that the cell cytoplasm is uh, in an incompressible fluid, and the height remains nearly the constant, and those two considerations lead to this area constant. The second part is the perimeter constant, and this is basically coming from the result, uh, the, uh, the property of the cellular, site, uh, the cellular cortex as well as the cell cell adhesion. So those uh, aspects uh, are lead to this perimeter constant with a um, target perimeter P0. Given this energy function, we, all, we can also define a uh, effective temperature, which includes all possible activities and at temperature T. Now, given this energy function, one needs also different models uh, to simulate the behavior of the system. 
And these models represent the cells as polygons with a target area A0 and the target perimeter P0. Uh, there are several types of models. Uh, some of them are continuum, such as the vertex model or the Voronoi model. And the others are the discrete lattice-based models, such as the cellular POS model. And here are some snapshots from our simulation. Now, given this uh, theoretical model and the energy function H, our goal is to first write down the probability distribution function of the cellular aspect ratio. And we have followed the prescription same as in the experimental paper. We first write down the direction tensor, we diagonalize it, we get the two eigenvalues, which are proportional to the major and square of the major and the minor axis, and then we uh, define the aspect ratio and obtain the distribution of the aspect ratio. But even at this level of simplification, writing down a, the, the, a, the probability distribution function for the aspect ratio is uh, somewhat challenging. So we took a slightly indirect route. Uh, we first calculate the distribution of the radius of gyration around the, around the center of mass, and then obtain the desired distribution of the aspect ratio. Uh, we can write down this uh, quantity formally as follows. Uh, the, sorry. So the probability distribution function of the squared radius of gyration, and uh, so this is a formal way of writing any probability distribution function. The first delta function basically coincides the center of mass of the, of the cells to the origin of the coordinate system. The second delta function basically picks up a specific component of S square. The exponential is a Boltzmann factor, and I'll get back to it uh, in the next slide. And this last part is a volume element. So this is a complicated way of writing just the volume element. We are following a notation from the polymer physics literature. Now, this is within the model, uh, within the model description is exact. But uh, to get an useful form from here requires uh, several assumptions. And these assumptions are either motivated by our uh, simulations or, or they are tested in the simulation. Now, I'll just uh, uh, point out a couple of uh, these assumptions. First one is this Boltzmann distribution. This is quite crucial. And so this basically, the, uh, the, each of the configuration arises with this energy. And this we have tested in the simulation. So one of the results, for example, uh, log p as a function of e over t should uh, fall on top of each other, each of the point, and it should be straight line uh, in this uh, semi-log uh, representation. Apart from the first point, it seems to follow that description. Uh, the second point is the constant of con the Carlos simulation or an actual vice principal? Uh, both, uh, both the MD and Monte Carlo actually. Monte Carlo will by definition give you this. Yeah, exactly, but also MD. Uh, okay, the other aspect is that the constant of confluency is not crucial for the cell shape. And uh, this we have tested in, uh, in several ways and uh, defined uh, several arguments. Uh, one of them is as follows. The constant of confluency can enter this uh, description only via this area term. Now, if it, if it affects very strongly, then if I keep all of the other parameters constant and simulate the system for different values of lambda a, it should depend on that value of lambda, b, lambda a. So what we find when we keep all the other parameters constant and vary lambda a, the probability distribution function of the aspect ratio seems to fall on top of each other. So this is a way of showing that it is not very sensitive to this area term. So now after going through all of uh, uh, the algebra and all of these uh, using these assumptions, we can write down the, uh, the probability distribution function of the R, R is the aspect ratio. And this has this particular form. Uh, N is a normalization coefficient. We have an exact expression for N. This is slightly complicated. But the main point is the following, that all the system specific parameters, these are these lambda P, P naught, T, etc., all of them combine into a single parameter that describes the probability distribution function of this or cell shape variability in the monolayer. And this has important consequence that all of these combine into a single parameter for the universal properties that I'll uh, show in the next slide. So first, let's uh, write down, uh, plot some of the distribution function for different value of alpha. So different value of alpha essentially gives different system because all the system specific parameter enter into alpha and they have some, some type of distribution. Uh, but when we plot the distribution, the PDF of the scaled aspect ratio, which is ratio of aspect ratio minus one divided by average aspect ratio minus one, this seems to be very, very uh, so weakly dependent on alpha. So it's not exactly universal, but the dependence on alpha becomes extremely weak. So that is the near universal behavior that they observed in the experimental system. Furthermore, if I ignore one over R compared to R, then the PDF of the scaled aspect ratio becomes exactly k gamma function. And uh, so in that case, the k, value of k becomes 2.5 simply because of this, uh, this exponent being 3 by 2. 
Now this C by two comes from a mathematical property that the perimeter is a closed loop object. Now this must be true because perimeter must be a closed loop object, so you cannot avoid it, and therefore k must be two point five. But ignoring one over r compared to r is not a very good approximation because r is of the order of one, and therefore the, when one fits this k gamma function for the experimental or the simulation data, what one finds is a range of k. So it actually varies from one point five to five point five, or somewhat like that. Now, other aspect of universality, uh, because there is only one parameter in the description, both the standard deviation will be some function of alpha, and we can also write down the average aspect ratio, some other function of alpha. Now, using these two equations, I can now eliminate alpha and write down standard deviation as a function of the average aspect ratio. This equation is independent of alpha, but it means that it must be same for all the system. And uh, this, when we do all of these things, uh, standard deviation as a function of average aspect ratio has this particular equation. This has actually quite complicated uh, analytical form, but within the linear order, we can write down this particular equation. So this basically fits, nearly fits this entire regime, except a very small deviation at the beginning. Then we tested all of these approximations in, in our uh, simulations. Uh, so these are the simulation for the cellular POTS model and the vertex model. And this is a near universal aspect uh, when we plot the PDF of the scale aspect ratio, and they seem to fall on top of each other. So this is the dependence on the other parameters become very weak. The other aspect, the standard deviation as a function of the average aspect ratio. So this is uh, the symbols are the simulation data, and the dashed line is the theory. And note that this is not a fit. It's simply because there is no fitting parameter in the theory. This is simply comparison between the theory and the simulation data, and they seem to agree quite remarkably well. So you always simulate in the, the vertex model in a fluid regime. You in a fluid regime. Mm -hmm. Does it matter how deep you are in a fluid regime? I mean, these kind of things. So we have explored uh, quite uh, high temperature. So fluid regime, we mostly explored uh, wherever we can be in the. So within the simulation, we did not find deviation from this explore, uh, this this value. But uh, if you go to very extreme regime, possibly there will be some deviation because of the assumption will break down. But uh, within the regime that uh, people have simulated for the glassy aspects, uh, we do not see any of the deviation. First, if you go to close to the solid regime, I mean, in the solid regime, things are going to get much more regular. So presumably, this would break down. Yeah, no? so, yeah, so, yeah. So, so. And at the very small value of the average aspect ratio, when the aspect ratio becomes very close to 1, then this theory will start breaking down. So then we took the data from this uh, experimental paper uh, the, by Atiya et al. And uh, we compared with the experimental data. But in the interest of time, let me just skip that point and go to the next one. So here, the, one of the major prediction of the theory is the near universal um, uh, distribution of the PDF of the scaled aspect ratio. So we have chosen two different values of alpha. We think that they represent most of the experimental system. But for other values of alpha, they seem to they, they will fall very nearly close to each other. So with these two values of alpha, we have uh, plotted this PDF of the scaled aspect ratio. And then we have kept, uh, we have taken data from four different papers for the PDF of the scaled aspect ratio. And we simply plotted them in the same figure. So yeah, and we see that they fall nearly on top of each other. Uh, the type of uh, the, the diversity of this data is qu quite remarkable. So we have various cancer cell lines, asthmatic, non-asthmatic, HBC cells, MDCK cells, Drosophila wing disease, simulation of active and equilibrium system, and many others. Yet, all of them seem to follow this nearly universal behavior and consistent with the theoretical prediction. We have also tested this uh, other aspect, uh, the universal aspect, because there is only one parameter, standard deviation is a function of average aspect ratio, independent of the system details. And uh, in this also, we have taken data from three different papers. And this is a theoretical prediction. This is not a fit again, I mean, just for comparison. And uh, these symbols are the data from the experimental paper. And they seem to be reasonably agreeing with each other. Uh, we have then tested this particular assumption that I talked about that the constant of confluency is not crucial for the distribution of the aspect ratio. And for this, we have uh, collaborated with a colleague from the NCASR, Rajesh Vanupati, and they have created a very nice system for these uh, the, uh, for this uh, monolayer. They have taken a very thin layer, a thin clip of paper, glued the two ends, then take some uh, active particle and place those active particles inside this uh, ring of the paper. And when they place this system on a vertically vibrated plate, then the active particles basically drag the paper, paper clip, and that is the minimal model of cell. 
when they place a large number of them, so this is the uh, monolayer, cellular monolayer that uh, we are trying to mimic. And for this system, there are all the properties of the model or the theoretical model that we want to understand, except the constant of confluency. So this system, by definition, is not uh, is not confluent. And then we have uh, compared with the with the prediction. So, uh, for example, this one, the standard deviation as a function of the average aspect ratio. These data are coming from biological systems that we showed earlier. These data are coming from this system. And they seem to be consistent with each other. And they are also consistent with the theoretical prediction, which is this uh, line, uh, the straight line that uh, I showed earlier. The other aspect, this near universal behavior, yeah. So, what, what is the area uh, of the shape that you're looking at in the experiment? So, but uh, it's, uh, it's the same prescription. We, uh, we uh, take this uh, cell, write down the gyration tensor, then diagonalize, and then obtain the aspect ratio as the ratio of the square root of two eigenvalues. So, so, the experiment is uh, working with those active particles. Uh, so, these, these particles are not, uh, so these, are, these we are ignoring. So, what we are writing down is the dilation tensor is for this particular one. The, the models also represent the cells, not by the, I mean, ignoring all the biological details, but by the sort of polymer. No, but you have a confluent layer of those cells as defined, or that, that so, for, for this system, so the, yeah. the, the result that we are writing down is for this in a highly dense regime, not for the single cell. For the single cell, actually, this will not work. I mean, this would. Uh, and the other aspect of the near universality aspect, the probability distribution function of the scale aspect ratio, that also seems to work. And this uh, line is the theoretical line, and uh, these are the, the data are the symbol. Okay. So now, given this uh, this uh, probability distribution function of the cell shape, uh, what are the implications? And I'll just briefly point out some of the implications. The first implication that we are studying currently is looking at the constant, uh, the effect of confinement. So when this EMT happens, the uh, the uh, uh, mesenchymal cells they develop this in-plane polarity and then they become motile. So compared to those mesenchymal cells, the epithelial cells are more sedentary and glass-like. So now if I consider a monolayer of epithelial cells and include a cluster of mesenchymal cells in the monolayer, then I can study the property, the static property of the mesenchymal cells as a function of number of cells in that cluster. So this is what we have done. So this is the standard deviation as a function of average aspect ratio. When I change the number of mesenchymal cells in the cluster, then I see that there is a deviation from this mean field prediction, which would be true for the entire monolayer. So what we are trying to explore currently is can we use this type of consideration or this uh, framework to understand the early stage of the EMT transition. The second implication is the predictive power of the theory and this is in collaboration with my colleagues from TIFR Hyderabad, the Moniz and Tomal. Uh, so here, because there is only one parameter within the theory, if I know any property of the monolayer, I can actually predict from that what is the distribution of the cell shape. So for example, here we have uh, uh, the calculated, so this is done both in the simulation and the experiment. And here, for example, let's say if I know average aspect ratio, from there I can analytically calculate what will be the value of alpha. And from knowledge of alpha now, I can calculate what is the distribution. So in the experiment, we have calculated the average aspect ratio uh, for that entire system. And from there, I can calculate the value of alpha. And knowing alpha, I already know theoretically what is the PDF uh, of the aspect ratio. In the experiment, we can also calculate what is the PDF of the aspect ratio, and here is the comparison. The symbols are the, are the experimental data, and the lines are the theoretical prediction, and they seem to agree quite well. This is another test of the similar aspects, and the division and the function of the aspect ratio, and these are for another set of data taken from this uh, paper by Fedberg's group. Okay, so now the, the another implication is that uh, we wanted to develop, okay, we wanted to develop an effective parameter uh, the description for the cell, uh, cellular monolayer. So this will allow a the parameter that we can actually measure in the experiment, directly measurable experiment uh, parameter. And here the claim is that we can describe the, the system property, static property in terms of alpha. So the earlier couple of slides, we have shown this for the entire monolayer, but here we actually went into the local level. Because there is a distribution of cell shape, if I measure it locally, the average area, average shape, uh, average aspect ratio, that will vary from each region to another region. 
And so here we have uh, divided the entire system into different boxes and taken measured the aspect ratio for each of the boxes and also the average aspect ratio. Then we pull the data according to the average aspect ratio. So average aspect ratio essentially is equivalent to alpha. And then we plot uh, the uh, simulation data and the lines are the theoretical prediction and they, they also seem to agree quite well. So it basically shows that the, we can use alpha as an effective parameter to describe the, the static property of the system. We've also done it in the experiment and here are some data for the Drosophila wing disk. We have done the, the, taken the entire system, divided it into boxes, pulled the data according to their average uh, aspect ratio in each of the boxes and here are the comparison between the theory and the experiment. And this is about the, the cell division aspect as talking about earlier. So if there is a strong correlation between cell division and the cell shape, and this, uh, this equivalent parameter, the alpha, if I can use it for cell shape distribution, then I can use another parameter which should be equivalent, which is time away from the division. So what we did, we have taken hundreds of hours of data of MDCK monolayer. We go to each of the cells which are dividing and we, are, we register their time. And then I take the major, the aspect ratio time away from the uh, division. And then we pull the data according to their time away from division. We plot the PDF of the aspect ratio as well as the average aspect ratio as a function of time from the division. And there seems to be a characteristic um, uh, the, the behavior for each of those. So this basically shows that it, is, it might be possible to use this metric of cell shape uh, as a theoretical way of describing or a, as a con uh, condition for cell, cell division. Okay, just in the next couple of minutes, let me just simply point out one crucial aspect of these systems. Contrary to these uh, particulate models, these uh, confluence system, the glassy dynamics in the confluence system has a very strong correlation with the static property. So for example, if you look at the standard deviation as a function of average aspect ratio, as the cell becomes more glassy, as their relaxation time increases, as they become more sluggish, the point on this plot moves towards the origin. So as the uh, relaxation time changes, their aspect ratio and standard deviation, there is a strong correlation between the two. We have also tested this aspect in our simulation for uh, relaxation time as a function of alpha, and this is the average aspect ratio for both vertex model and uh, cellular pot model, and there seems to be the similar type of correlation. We have also tested in this synthetic cell mimic uh, the similar aspect. Also, we are uh, developing uh, the simplified analytical theories for the glassy dynamics in these systems. These points are, uh, are data from the numerical simulations, and the lines are the analytical uh, the theories. And there seems to be sort of a reasonable agreement between the two. For example, if you look at this 3D phase diagram coming from this paper by Max and Lisa Manning and others, and uh, so this is the simulation data, and this is uh, coming from the analytical theory, and they again seem to agree quite, uh, quite well. So the idea here is to include this uh, metric of cell shape the, in terms of alpha, such that we can now describe both the dynamics and the static property, and in terms of the function, if it uh, actually works, then we will be able to actually try to develop the, um, this, uh, the, this theoretical framework for both morphogenesis as well as uh, this uh, early stage of the EMT. So to conclude, uh, we showed that the distribution of the scaled aspect ratio is not exactly, but nearly universal. And uh, on the other hand, the standard deviation versus the average aspect ratio seems to be universal. And uh, the data till now seems to suggest in the positive direction that we might be able to use alpha as an effective parameter to describe both the function and the dynamics.